You know the story. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and discovered America. He was trying to get to India, but everyone thought he was insane because the earth was flat, and so sailing west would just lead to his death. But Columbus knew that the earth was round, and he knew that if he kept sailing west into the Atlantic, eventually he'd make his way into Asia. She's around the back of my head! She's flat like your head. But as you may know already, this story is only a legend. Because people in the Middle Ages knew that the Earth was round. The reason nobody had sailed across the Atlantic is because they thought that the journey over open ocean would be too long and dangerous. Columbus's argument wasn't that the Earth was round, but that it was a lot smaller than most people believed, and so the journey would actually be feasible. He was wrong, but he thought he was right when he landed in what is today the Bahamas and assumed that he was on some islands off the coast of Asia. But not everyone was convinced, and in 1501, the Florentine explorer Americo Vespucci claimed that these lands were actually a new continent, and that's why they're named after him, Amerigo to America. Though Columbus was convinced until the end of his life that he found Asia. Those who doubted Columbus were right to think that the journey would be too long, because the size of the earth had been known for almost 2,000 years at that point. Several ancient Greek philosophers had theorized that the earth was round for a variety of reasons. Some simply because a sphere was considered the perfect shape, and others, like Aristotle, had pointed out that stars could be seen in different positions in the sky, or different stars altogether, depending on how far north or south you were, which only makes sense if the Earth is round. The standard measurement of the Earth's size was calculated by Eratosthenes, who did so by comparing the length of shadows created by rods of the same length during the summer solstice at two different locations, Alexandria and Syene, which were almost on the same meridian. With some trigonometry, he was able to calculate the Earth's circumference to within about 2% of its actual value. Columbus rejected these measurements, however, and using various maps, he theorized that the Earth was actually about two-thirds that size. Now, by Columbus's time, Eratosthenes' works on geography and the measurements of the Earth had been lost. And indeed, one might say, well, in the Middle Ages, so much ancient knowledge was lost, how do we know that they didn't lose that? And that, my friends, is an excellent question. First of all, People often assume that medieval society lost a lot more than it actually did. Now, they did lose some, it's true, but they also retained quite a bit as well. And as I've mentioned in several other videos, many lost Greek works would be rediscovered throughout the later half of the Middle Ages, through Arabic translations, and eventually, by the Renaissance, through translations directly from the Greek manuscripts preserved in the Byzantine Empire, which had often retained this knowledge the whole time. Although Eratosthenes' original works would be lost to the ages, his conclusions were preserved in other texts, like Ptolemy's Geography, which was translated into Latin in 1406 and was available to Columbus and his peers. But even without translating Ptolemy, the knowledge that the earth was round was never lost. First of all, the Roman author Pliny the Elder writes about the earth's roundness in his natural history, which because it was written in Latin rather than Greek, stuck around in Western Europe even after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. In it, he says quite clearly that, It is her shape first on which opinion is unanimous. For certain, we speak of the earth as a sphere, and we acknowledge the globe's enclosure within poles. And we know that this wasn't just knowledge in dusty old books left on shelves and never read, because medieval people themselves say the same thing. Now, there were some early Christian writers who had their doubts as to whether the Earth was a sphere, but they were all well aware of the theory, and they were probably more the exception rather than the rule. They were just concerned as to whether or not it agreed with scripture. But in any case, by the fall of Rome, pretty much everyone seems to have agreed that the Earth was round. We can see this in the early 7th century in the writings of Isidore, the Bishop of Seville in Visigothic Spain. He wrote a work called De Natura Rerum, or On the Nature of Things. 
It was a sort of encyclopedia, something he wrote several of, and in it he summarized ancient knowledge for his early medieval audience. Isidore wrote about the earth and its divisions, taking for granted the fact that it was a sphere, which actually makes reading those passages a little confusing because he sometimes quotes others who talk about it as if it was flat. He often tried to marry classical and Christian concepts, and it didn't always come out very smoothly. But in any case, he also writes here, and more clearly in his more famous work on etymologies, that the earth was divided into climatic zones, which had different temperatures and habitability based on their distance from the poles. And he notes how these zones were mirrored in the northern and southern hemispheres. Another early medieval author, the Northumbrian monk Bede, who lived about 100 years later, was even more explicit in his description of the earth's shape. He was inspired by Isidore to write his own De Natura Rerum, but he also added things from other sources, including Pliny. In chapter 46, Bede writes, We say the sphere of the earth, not because it has the shape of a perfect sphere, in view of so great a disparity of mountains and plains, but because, if all of its perpendicular lines were enclosed within a circumference, it would make the figure of a perfect sphere. And therefore it happens that the stars of the northern region always appear to us, but never those of the southern region. And in turn, these northern stars are not seen by those people, because they are blocked by the globe of the earth. The country of the Troglodytes and neighboring Egypt do not see the great and little bear, nor does Italy see Canopus. One thing to note, by the way, is that the translation I'm using by Kendall and Wallace of Bede's work is translating sphere from the Latin term orbis, and the quote from Pliny that I used earlier did the same thing. Now, orbis in some cases could be used to refer to a flat circle, but it's more frequently used, as Bede is here, in reference to an actual sphere. As I'm sure you probably figured, it's where we get the word orb. Throughout the Middle Ages, the Earth is often referred to as Orbis Terrae, Sphere of the Earth, like Bede did at the beginning of this quote, or sometimes even just as Orbis. And Bede is explaining here in his Encyclopedia on Nature why that is. In the very next chapter, he talks about climatic zones, just like Isidore, but he also adds for each of them the length of a shadow from a seven-foot rod measured at noon on the equinox, the exact thing Eratosthenes used to measure its circumference, showing not only his knowledge of the Earth's roundness, but also of ways to measure it. Again, Bede and Isidore were figures from the early Middle Ages, the supposed Dark Ages as some people call them, and yet they had this knowledge even then. In later medieval centuries, evidence for it only increases. But we don't even have to look just at literature to know this is true. We can also look at art. Since the conversion of the Roman emperors, a common symbol of a ruler's authority has been the globus cruciger, or cruciger, or cruciger, however you want to pronounce your Latin, or cross-bearing globe. This object represents the world under the dominion of Christ, with the cross being Christ and the globe the world. A ruler holding it symbolizes their temporal stewardship, you could say, with their power existing at God's behest. By the early Renaissance, we start seeing paintings of Christ himself holding the Globus Cruciger, representing his role as Salvatore Mundi, or Savior of the World. Now, if you really wanted to, you could argue that these globes represent the universe and not the Earth itself, and that within this circular, spherical universe, you could have a flat Earth. And yeah, sure, okay, great argument. But these globes are often divided by a T-shape, which is actually an abstract representation of the three continents of Africa, Europe, and Asia, divided by the Mediterranean, the Nile, and the Don rivers. And this is an extremely common medieval image called a TO or OT map, meaning that the Earth is likely being understood here, especially since no king had mastered space travel yet. I guess it's only a matter of time before we start seeing Elon Musk holding one of these things. Now, to be fair, if you asked a random peasant in rural Sweden, let's say, what shape the earth was, they might very well say that it was flat. Just like if you asked a random person on the street in New York City how a computer worked, they probably wouldn't be able to tell you. Just because that knowledge existed doesn't mean that everyone possessed it. But 
Anyone who knew anything about nature and natural history would have been well aware that the earth was round, and anyone with a formal education would have learned some natural history. Columbus wouldn't have been laughed off for saying that the earth was round. Sadly, Bugs Bunny is not a reliable scholarly source on the matter. Till next time. Thank you.